Thank you all for coming to the seventh annual Rebelly Symposium. I'm Christine Larson. I'm a PhD student and I organized this event. This is my fifth year organizing it. I have the honor of being the Rebelly First Amendment Fellow, which means that part of my job <coughs> is to bring people together around this event. And this event, the Rebelly Symposium, has been conceived in a very special way. Every year, we bring scholars together with practitioners in the field so that we can have a conversation, not just about the academic ideas around communication and free speech and digital technology, but around what's actually happening in the world. Ideally, these two things always fit together perfectly. But I find that these conversations end up informing everyone. And so that's the idea behind the Rebelly Symposium. A few thank yous quickly. Uh, a thank you to Mr. and Mrs. Rebelly sitting here in the front row. They are great friends of the department and make this and many other things possible here. So we're happy to have them. Um, a big thank you to Mark Dizzuti and everyone in the office who made this possible. And thank you. Thanks to Professor Jay Hamilton, who will be introducing our speakers in a moment. And also a thank you to you, the audience, not just for coming, but as I just pointed out, creating a vibrant and lively dialogue is the most important part of the Rebelly Symposium. So your presence here tonight and your conversation is really why we are here. So I want to thank you for coming and participating. And with that, I will turn it over to Professor Hamilton. Thank you. Um, so one more thank you. You did note that this was the fifth year that you've done this. And uh, Chris really does the whole thing. She imagines the idea, the topic, uh, invites the speakers, figures out the interactions, and then has me play Wolf Blitzer. So I'd really like to thank Chris for this. And um, this is her fifth symposium. This is the 30th anniversary of the uh, Roland and Pat Rebelly internship program. That internship program makes it possible for Stanford students to work at newspapers all around the country. It's led people to careers in journalism. So the Rebelly support for our, our program not only supports discussion of journalism, but it actually supports actual journalism. So I'd like to thank the Rebelys for that. So uh, today we're here to look at a very specific set of questions about the impact of data and technology on the 2016 elections. And our roadmap is very simple. I'm going to introduce the three panelists, tell you a little bit about their backgrounds. Each of them is going to speak for about 15 minutes. And then we're going to take questions from the people formerly known as the audience, which is everybody here. So who are our three panelists? This is the game show uh, aspect. Panelist number one is uh, Daniel Kreese. He's an assistant professor in the School of Media and Journalism and an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Communication Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Kreese's research explores the impact of technolo technological change on the public sphere and political practice. He's the author of uh, Taking Back Our Country, The Crafting of Network Politics from Howard Dean to Barack Obama, and Prototype Politics, Technology Intensive Campaigning and the Data of Democracy, which is due out from Oxford University Press in May 2016. He is also an affiliated fellow with Yale Law School's uh, Information and Society Project. Dan has a MA in journalism from our department, so he came here thinking he would be a journalist. He liked it so much, he became a PhD, so he has a PhD from our program, and he actually organized the first Rebelly Symposium. So if you are in the audience now, someday you may be over here. So Dan's <laughs> gonna be our first presenter. Second up is Carol Davidson. And as the Vice President for Political Technology at Comscore, Carol works to bridge the gap between what political campaigns, super PACs, and lobbyists need today and the technology they will need in the future as TV evolves. Before joining Comscore, she served as the Director of Integration and Media Targeting for the 2012 Obama for America reelection campaign, and she led the development of the Optimizer.
which is an analytical tool that combined campaign data with set-top box viewership data, and Narwhal, which was the integrated campaign API platform that unified political data available to every arm of the campaign. Carol has spent more than 18 years in the tech world building technical CRM billing and return path data audience measurement platforms for cable, satellite, and telecom industries. And our third panelist will be Jesse Baldwin-Filippi, who is an assistant professor of new media at Fordham University. Her work is fundamentally concerned with how engagement with new technologies can restructure forms of political participation in ideas about citizenship. She recently authored the book, Using Technology, Building Democracy, Digital Campaigning, and the Construction of Citizenship, which came out from Oxford University Press. So each of them will speak for about 15 minutes, and then we will go to questions. First up is Daniel. Do I have to pull this up, Chris? Is this, uh... We said 20. All right, it's pretty awesome to be back. <laughs> this is cool. Um, I want to say thanks to, to Chris and, and Jay um, and all the faculty mentors and student mentors I had when I was here. Um, and uh, it's, it's not only an honor to be here, um, being able to, to talk about uh, my work and my current book project, but also to share the stage with Carol and, and Jesse. Um, Carol uh, was a very key source for um, the work that I'm going to talk about today. Um, she was also um, generous enough um, to actually read an entire copy of the manuscript of the book um, and give me feedback on it, uh, tell me what I had wrong, um, what I had right, mostly what I had wrong, um, and uh, really sort of, I, I think, pushed my thinking on it to a new level, and I'm very grateful for that. And Jessie does amazing work, and I really wanted to share the stage with her um, because I think she frames a really nice set of questions around contemporary citizenship. Okay, um, so what I'm going to talk about today um, is um, why and how technolo uh, technology now lies at the basis of uh, contemporary electoral campaigning, the political com communication strategies of campaigns, um, and ultimately the practices of citizenship. And what I want to do today is to sort of frame a set of questions around um, the organizational side. So um, how and why are technologies um, suffusing electoral politics, and what sorts of people do this work and what do they do? Um, and what I'm going to do this is in sort of four movements, and I know that I only have uh, between 15 and 20 minutes. But I'll start generally just framing what I call this new era of technology-intensive campaigning. And then I'm going to talk about differences in adoption of technology by the Republican and Democratic parties um, using a set of, of quantitative data. Um, and then I'm going to explain those differences as a way to sort of bring us into thinking about what we're seeing during the 2016 campaign cycle. Okay? All right. So let me just start with technology-intensive campaigning. Um, this is a quote that I really love from uh, Michael Slaby, the chief technology officer of Obama 2008. And one of the things that he's talking about here is that when he joined the 2012 re-election bid, after having served as the uh, chief technology officer for the 2008 campaign, they were thinking about, well, how are they going to approach the re-election bid? And one of the things that they realized was that the world had changed. The world moves on us, in Slaby's terms, from even in those short years from 2008 to 2012. We have new technological platforms, new social media practices, new journalistic outlets, new database technologies, new talent and expertise that existed in the field. So even in the span of four years, when Slaby came back and said, what are we going to do? They sort of realized that the world looked a little bit different. Let me just give you one example of changes that happened in these four years. Um, Obama's victory tweet in 2008 was retweeted or shared 157 times. In 2012, Obama's victory tweet received more than 800,000 retweets in less than three days, right? Twitter is a new phenomenon in 2012, comparatively new, um, in terms of how people were using it, particularly the professional press and supporters, et cetera. 
So campaigns need to figure out how do we adopt to this ever-changing world. And for those of you who do work in journalism know that journalists and news, out, news organizations face very similar dilemmas, right? How do we make sense of this changing media landscape? Second of all, campaigning is now a fundamentally different um, technologically intensive practice than it was uh, even 10 or 20 years ago. So this is the data architecture of the Obama 2012 campaign. This comes from NGP Van, which is one of the leaders in democratic um, uh, uh, infrastructural technologies, and they basically maintain the Democratic Party's voter file. Um, the key point, and I know there's a bunch of folks in the back, so I'll just talk through it here, is that every aspect of contemporary electioneering is a newly technology and data intensive practice. This was not the case 20 years ago. It certainly wasn't the case um, uh, 30 years ago. This is a fundamentally new era, and it requires staffers with new forms of expertise, new forms of skills, um, and new forms of knowledge and practice in terms of how to work with it. Just to give you some examples, um, field campaigning is a newly technologically intensive practice. For any of you who have ever volunteered for a campaign um, over the last two election cycles, you're going to be knocking on doors while carrying a smartphone or an iPad, right? And being able to record data from the conversations that you're making with people right at that moment in time. That feeds into databases. I'll talk a little bit more about Carol's work. Um, but Television advertising is now increasingly a technology and data intensive practice, where campaigns use large scale databases in order to figure out who to target and what to say to them. Okay? Um, digital technologies and digital advertising is a newly data intensive practice, um, as well as financial um, uh, fundraising is a newly data, data and technology intensive practice, figuring out who your donors are going to be, crunching numbers on them, et cetera. In this world, one of the basic questions I had was, well, how do campaigns adapt and innovate in this changing world where technologies and data are increasingly central to campaign practice? Now, not to get too theoretical on you for a moment, and again, for those of you in the back, I will just sort of speak this out loud. The dominant perspective on how campaigns adapt to changing technology context is what we would call rational choice theories, which is, in essence, where Campaigns make reasonably effective use of reasonably similar, similar resources and technologies. The basic model of this story that a lot of political scientists have is that campaign staffers look out and they all see the same world and they all figure out how to strategically navigate that world, right? And then they adopt technologies in order to gain electoral advantage in some ways. Now, this story didn't really sound quite right to me, in part because there was a lot of wonderful journalism from the 2012 cycle that talked about differences between the two uh, political parties. And indeed, one of the things that the GOP themselves sort of talked about in 2013 was the fact that there were these massive differences between the two parties. So this rational choice perspective isn't quite right because both parties are bringing similar resources to the table and yet they seem to be adapting technologies in different ways. So this is the GOP Growth and Opportunity Project report. Um, I'll spare you the methodological details, but basically they talk to thousands of party operatives at all levels of office. Um, they talk to candidates, they talk to consultants, and they tried to figure out how are we um, uh, stacked up against the Democrats when it comes to many different areas of campaign practice, but for my purposes, tech. And one of the things that basically they pointed out is that Democrats had the clear edge on both new media and the ground game, those field campaign uh, uh, tools. Okay. So one of the things when I was approaching my book was to figure out, well, if we do have these big differences between the parties, how do we explain them? How do we understand innovation and where it comes from? And here, just to throw a little more theory at you, but I'll talk through it, um, I turned to organizational sociologists, including Woody Powell, who's over here in the education school. And one of the things that organizational sociologists who study innovation argue is that innovation tends to come from people who cross domains of activity. People who leave places like the technology or the commercial industry, for example, and wind up in places like electoral politics. And when they come on over and they cross fields, what do they bring with them? They bring with them new skills and practices, ways of seeing the world, new knowledge, right, of how to work with and manipulate data, et cetera. This is Carol, who's sitting here now, right, which I'll talk about in a, in a little bit. But generally, this is what organizational sociologists basically argue, is that innovation comes from unexpected transpositions of people and technologies across different domains of activity. 
But it's not enough to just have all people from industry, for example. What you need is cognitive diversity. And this is a framework that comes from David Stark and his colleagues' work, who's an organizational th sociologist at Columbia, who argues that if you have all engineers or all people who come from the tech industry, well, they're not going to do a great job either because they don't understand electoral politics. Right? If you have everybody who's looking to develop the next killer app and they wander into politics, how do they know what a field campaign looks like? How do they know what effective messaging is in the context of electoral politics? Right? So you need both. You need cognitive diversity, people who come from different industries and the skills that mix there, right? in order to have an innovation camp uh, and innovations that are ultimately adapted for electoral politics. Well, one of the things that I set out to do with my grad students was first to quantify what sorts of differences might we see between the two parties? And second, does this framework on innovation hold where what we would expect is on the democratic side of the aisle, we would see more people coming from outside of politics into electoral politics, and then we would see them mixing with staffers who worked in electoral politics. So one of the things I did with my grad students is we built an innovative data set of 629 technology, digital data, and analytics staffers who worked on every presidential primary and general election bid from 2004 to 2012. All right. Um, and what did we find? Uh, well, first of all, top line numbers is that we found massive differences between the two parties, precisely along the lines of what we would expect from a lot of the journalistic reports in the GOP's own accounting. So Democratic campaigns from 04 to 12 hired um, 507 staffers in tech, digital data, and analytics, compared with 123 Republicans. Right? So go back to that theoretical expectation that campaigns would see the world in the same way and take similar strategies. That's not the case at all, actually. We see very big differences between the two parties. I'm going to explain them in a minute, but just top line number. Okay, so the next thing we did after we compiled this massive data set using Federal Elections Commission data um, as well as other data sources, we then took all those 629 staffers, or more accurately, my amazing graduate students did, and we paired them with LinkedIn data, all done manually. So we actually created a data set that listed their entire professional histories. And then we coded it to figure out where were people coming from when they worked in politics. All right. By the way, this data set is totally public. People should use it. It's on my website. Um, if you just Google me, it will come up. Um, and uh, you're, you're free to run with it and do more analyses with it. So one of the things that we found is that precisely in keeping with our theoretical expectations, Democrats not only hire more staffers, but they actually are pulling in people from outside of conventional avenues in politics. Um, so just to take one example, on the 2012 Obama campaign, out of 342 total staffers working in tech, digital data, and analytics, 73 had primary employment backgrounds in the political field. This is like work for political party organizations or political action committees, et cetera. But 48 of those staffers also came with primary backgrounds in the technology industry. All right? um, even more came from the commercial industry. Just for presentation purposes, I selected certain aspects of the data. Um, but what's actually happening here, and, and this runs against a lot of the expectations we have that, perf that politics is increasingly professionalized, one of our findings was that campaigns actually work to deprofessionalize them sta their staffs so they can stay innovative in this changing world that I talked about earlier. Okay? The other thing that we looked at when we looked at the LinkedIn data was firm founding. So one of our arguments is that, well, if the Democrats do have this tech advantage, something has to be the mechanism that carries across electoral cycles, right? So um, those staffers might go on to work for other bids, but are they also founding firms and organizations that institutionalize the innovative work of campaigns and then serve to carry them across cycles and down ballot? So we looked at firm founding, and what we found was, was pretty surprising. Um, first of all, the political field is pretty generative of, of companies more generally. So this is just a network map from 4 to 12 on the Republican side of the aisle. 14 different people founded 15 different firms. These are presidential campaign staffers who founded increasingly prominent firms. You can sort of see just one example, Deep Root Analytics, which was founded by uh, Romney's analytics director, uh, Alex Lundry. He then went on to work for the Bush campaign. Um, but the idea is that you take the knowledge and the, and the money and technologies in presidential politics and you carry it forward. But even here, we saw another big difference between the two parties. So Republican side, 14 people, 15 firms. On the Democratic side, 
65 different staffers founded 67 different firms and organizations, just from 4 to 12. This is amazing, all right? Now, I could pull out, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of these firms later on. Um, but just one example, Civis Analytics, which, which grew out of um, the 2012 Obama campaign, brought one-third of the 54-person analytics team from Obama into their own private firm, where they're now, where they work down ballot in 2014, and now they provide some of the analytics work for Hillary, and they have a range of commercial clients as well. So this knowledge and transfer of knowledge across electoral cycles through firms helps explain the differences between the two parties. Okay, I have eight minutes, so I'm going to go a little fast. All right. What accounts for this? So, so the network data and the quantitative data do a great job describing differences between the two parties, right? Um, but in my book, I wanted to go back and sort of provide an explanatory account by drawing on historical uh, evidence from people like from Carol, um, as well as other archival sources. And I'm happy to talk more about those in the Q&A. The fundamental argument in my book, though, is that it was this man's campaign that set in motion this transformation within the Democratic Party network. So everyone remembers Howard Dean, right? He fails in 2004. This is him actually fundraising uh, while eating a turkey sandwich. Um, Dean's campaign actually pioneered small dollar online fundraising, right? Even though Dean crashed and burned in 2004, what happened is, is that after John Kerry lost, the Democratic Party network as a whole was looking for new models and new ways to do things. They felt they were behind in much the same way the GOP believed they were behind after 12. All right? So what happens? Well, it turns out that Dean's staffers, they go everywhere. Right? Um, they bring with them technologies, and they migrate and found new organizations and then bring them across electoral cycles into the party itself. So one quick example. Four of Dean's staffers found the firm Blue State Digital, which is now the key piece of email infrastructure for the entire Democratic Party network. They rebuild Dean's original tool set into version 2.0, bring it to the party in 2006, version 3.0, and then Joe Rospers becomes the new media director of Obama 2008, and they use MyBarackObama.com, which is Blue State's provided um, content management uh, system to power their campaign. Fast forward this four more years, Rospers is the chief digital strategist for the Obama campaign in 2012, right? It's this transfer across time. But what's key is that it was because Dean lost that everyone looked to the Dean campaign to say, we want that Dean magic. We want to figure out how to do this in our own contexts and domains. On the Republican side of the aisle, and again, for folks in the back, real briefly, I'll talk through this. Um, even though the Bush bid was advanced comparatively to the Democrats in 04, they never sort of had the same performance of digital savviness and tech like the Democrats did around the Dean campaign, right? Everyone remembers Dean's run. Um, so this is Patrick Ruffini, who worked for the party for a while and was also a Bush 04 vet, basically saying, we didn't quite do the marketing in a way that suggested that this new world of tech, digital data, and analytics was important. And indeed, they did not make the same investments on the Republican side of the aisle after 04. In part, they won, right? So there was less urgency. But in part, because they just started, to, they didn't see the world in the same terms as the Democrats who were starting to invest in tech. So this is Chuck DeFeo, who was the e-campaign manager for Bush. He was also the chief digital officer for the RNC, basically talking about how between four and eight, there was stagnation on the Republican side of the aisle with respect to their basic tech and infrastructure services. And indeed, one of the important stories to this, and again, sorry for the folks in the back, um, is that um, culture is embedded in networks. And the Republican Party failed to invest in tech, digital data, and analytics or see its importance. Um, and what that means is that there were differences between the two parties on display in 12, and I would argue that carried through to 2016, um, in terms of, of a culture of, of tech, digital data, and analytics. All right, let me just point to some of the work that these field crossers did. Um, first of all, this is the Obama dashboard system. It didn't quite come together in the way that a lot of folks on the campaign would have liked. 
Um, but it was the product of a tech team working in collaboration with um, field staffers that basically built an online campaign volunteer platform. Um, an innovative technology that worked to solve a number of problems that were the case in previous electoral cycles, but that enabled people to get involved in new ways around the campaign. Here's Carol. Um, Carol's always a great example of me. I will let her talk about the optimizer, which I'm assuming you will. Um, but Carol's a great example of someone who comes from commercial industry. Um, with a background in commercial industry, she made a donation to the 2008 campaign. When the 12 campaign was looking for talent, which is also important because the Obama campaign knew what it needed and then set out to find it in recruiting. This is another big difference between the parties. They found Carol, who then pioneered a number of new ways to do things like um, targeted uh, 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 television advertising. Um, and finally, another example is targeted sharing, where the Obama campaign um, basically uh, synced the voter file with Facebook accounts in order to do personalized appeals through social media. Now, what happened on the Romney side was that there just wasn't the same investment in tech, digital data, and analytics. I briefly went viral last year um, uh, for this quote. Um, but basically, um, this is Caitlin Checklet, who's the Chief Digital Integration Director, talking about how at the end of the campaign, 22 individuals had to vet the digital content that the Romney campaign was putting out online. Right? Um, whereas on the Obama campaign, the digital team had the autonomy to produce and put out their own content, in part because Democrats had been investing in this area, saw it was important, and had a cadre of skilled staffers that they built up over time. Another example from 12, Orca, which everyone seems to remember, um, but really just a failed technological development project on the Romney campaign. Um, where they tried to do a, a get out the vote a day of application um, that did not quite come together. And then finally, this is Alex Lundry, who was their data, their data and analytics officer, basically talking about how there wasn't the same commitment to tech and analytics throughout the, Ob throughout the Romney campaign in 2012. All right, let me conclude in my minute and 15 seconds just by talking about what we see during this cycle. I mentioned Civis Analytics earlier, but this is a key dynamic. The Democrats just have a much deeper bench of staffers who have worked in electoral politics in these domains. They have more talent and more expertise to draw on. And they have that, that um, uh, set of firms like Civis that are currently working with their presidential campaigns as well as all the way down ballot on tech and data analytics. And this even extends outside of Hillary Clinton. So this is Revolution Messaging, um, which is the digital consultancy behind Bernie Sanders' run. Um, and this was founded by Scott Goodstein, who was a 2008 Obama vet, um, who then went on to found this firm along with a number of other folks who worked on the Kerry and Dean bids and are now doing a lot of the digital and carrying that with them. And then finally, one of the things that we see on the Republican side of the aisle is in part given this institutional party failure, um, there's been organizations that now work with like the Koch brothers network instead of with the party and actually create rival data sources um, to the party itself. And I could talk more about that in a minute, but I will stop there and hand it over to Carol. see it on here, or I thought I did, but that's fine. I can look here. Uh, so this is me. This is uh, what I've been doing. I always get a little bit freaked out now that I have the 18 years of professional experience. I feel like I'm not that old uh, <laughs> at this point, but I didn't go to grad school, so I started a lot, started a lot earlier. Um, I was the 2012 Director of uh, Media in Data Integration, uh, which was Narwhal, and uh, Media Targeting, which was the Optimizer. Uh, and I now work at a company called Comscore, uh, which was recently acquired a company called Rentrack, where I originally worked. Rentrack has 40 million households worth of TV data uh, from the set-top boxes, and Comscore measures the web. Uh, and so their goal together as a company uh, is to merge these two data sets and provide true cross-platform measurement. So um, the same data set of being able to say, this is what people are watching in their home, uh, and this is their digital activity, right? And merging those two data sets together. Up until this point, I always say it's kind of like magic math when people are trying to pr report uh, cross-platform measurement. And so this will be 7 million households uh, worth of data, uh, combined data. 
so why did I join the campaign? We talked about this a little bit. This was a quote that I gave in some article after the campaign, and this is totally true. Um, but just the, the, the complete true story is that I worked at a startup that pioneered, uh, were the, was the first company that did return path data off of set-top boxes. So we wrote the code that sits on set-top boxes that sends back tuna records. Uh, that company was acquired by Microsoft. Uh, there was like a slight downturn in the economy that everyone everyone kind of remembers. Uh, Microsoft wasn't really managing as well, and I was miserable there. Uh, a six-year relationship that I was in uh, ended. Uh, and so I was in this very broken-hearted place uh, where my startup that I worked for kind of was lost in this Microsoft world. My romantic relationship had ended, and all of a sudden I got an email from Barack Obama because I bought a lawn sign in, uh, in a few campaigns before. So I was like, okay, this actually seems like the perfect thing for me to do in my life right now. Uh, and so I just kind of packed up and, and moved to Chicago, and it was a super kind of impulse uh, thing, and, and, I, and I showed up. Um, uh, so basically, micro-targeting plus match needs equals me moving to Chicago. Um, so life cycle of the campaign, just to give kind of, I'm a believer in thirds. I think everything kind of makes sense in thirds. Uh, so I joined the campaign in November 2011, kind of right after the first third was done. Uh, and so phase one of a campaign, like many organizations forming, are a lot of about fiefdom building, building teams. Uh, there's a lot of what I would call small p politics going on at this phase. And it's not until you transition into the second phase, which is right around the one year out mark uh, from when it becomes a reality, that it just starts setting in. Uh, and so all the, a lot of the small p politics that's going on in the beginning, uh, people finally give up on that and actually start getting work done. Uh, and then the last phase of the campaign is when you know, you give up your life, you stop talking to your parents, you have no other friends other than people in the campaign, you never leave the office, and your only goal is to get things done. Um, so uh, this is kind of it. And then there's, of course, the last page, which is GeoTV. So my background was in TV analytics, and everyone kept talking about GeoTV and having to get ready for GeoTV. And I thought it was some channel that I had never heard of. Uh, so I was super confused, but that is get out the vote. Uh, so I had never worked on a campaign clearly before before going there. The closest thing I had done was buy some lawn signs, um, be a donor, and uh, stand on street corners to register people to vote uh, a couple of times. So kind of going back to our first president, I give a little bit of history of, of where we've how we've gotten to where we are. Um, just a stat that I think is interesting, this number might have tweaked a little bit now that we're in the 2016 cycle, but for 65% of elections, the only way that people heard about the election was through print or word of mouth. Uh, there was no other technology to spread the word. Uh, and so just uh, my background is particularly in the communications industry. So it was not until the 20s and FDR where radio became possible. Uh, and it was not until the 60s <laughs> until there was penetration in, in TV households, right? So FDR became uh, fun facts that I think here is before FDR became president and started doing radio announcements, there was one staffer in the White House mailroom. Uh, and after he started doing this, there were like 70 staffers required to keep up, right? Because just the message is getting out so much more and people are responding to it. So this, I'm sure all of you guys have heard this, but this was the first presidential debate between Nixon and Kennedy. Uh, and Pretty much that debate was defined as the key moment of when the election was decided, basically because now it was, there is this new technolo technology medium, and Nixon wasn't prepared for it at the time, and he looked crappy, uh, and uh, Kennedy looked super polished, and you know the election was over, right? Uh, and so there's a bunch of so this slide's boring because it's just about databases, so you can't really make databases exciting. <laughs> But databases didn't come around until 1977, and they didn't really become powerful until the late 90s, is when, which is when I entered the workforce. Um, and so at the same time, CRMs, which are customer relationship management systems, is how do you keep track of your customers? So voter file is sim similar to this. Uh, started in the 80s and became kind of very commonplace technology. Some of the first technology that companies and corporations were buying, this is what I worked on uh, at that time, implementing CRM systems to telecom companies. So how do you bring all their customers uh, into an easy way under one house? Um, and so George Bush actually, after his first presidency, um, made it so that the voter file needed to be digitized, right? Which was just, that was only not that long ago, right? So this is the first time that all of these voter files all had to, they didn't have to, <laughs> 
I will believe that government understands technology when they define, and here's the API format and the data structure, and all of the files are exactly the same. I live in New York City, and the New York, the Manhattan file, the Brooklyn file, the Bronx file, the Staten Island file, they're all slightly different. Uh, so you have to do a lot of data tweaking to merge them all together, but at least they're digital. Um, and so, yeah, so it's just data about that. Uh, and so then George Bush won the second election, uh, in part because he was the first person, uh, the Carl Rove team, to say, okay, here's a person, right, that exists, but we're going to put them into a voter CRM. We're going to take advantage of databases, these voter files that we said now everyone has to make digitized, CRM systems that are really advanced, and we're going to load these things in, and it's going to make it much easier. Before that time, or still now in like smaller downbeat races, people would get their voter file on paper, and their big supporters would just kind of be like, oh, I know this guy, I know this guy, I know this guy. When you're using databases, you can do things like find someone who bought a lawn sign uh, and send an email to them to get them to work on the campaign, right? Uh, so then Barack Obama kind of comes around next, right? Um, and so in the first election, uh, technology was vastly different than what happened between 2012. Sleeby, uh, who I worked for on the campaign, um, is a perfect example. He was an English major from Brown. Right? Uh, in the first campaign, he knew how to use Facebook. He knew how to use Twitter. Right? He was a smart enough person to know that that wasn't going to cut it in the 2012 election, and so he made sure uh, that, that real technologists and people with data experience had kind of come onto the campaign, because the major difference that happened between 2008 and 2012, from my perspective, was cloud computing. And this is extremely important for a campaign because it's a short-lived organization. It forms and it shuts down. So in the real world, where you have to buy servers, rack them, get them to find a place, it's just like the infrastructure that you need to make available to you to do large-scale data analytics is really expensive and really time-consuming to put into place. Cloud con computing, you call up Amazon, they flick on some servers for you. You need more, they flick them on, right? They're there's like no work. You can just get all of the power of these machines without having to invest the infrastructure costs. Uh, and so what is, you know, this is it's a term that is no longer used. But when I first started working in the late 90s, it was called swivel chair integration. Uh, because people who, if you called up and you needed a new phone service, uh, you would call up and the person who was taking that order uh, would be using mainframe systems to um, to capture your data. So they would literally be in a chair and they would swivel over to one terminal and enter so you could get a bill. And then they'd swivel over to another terminal to make sure you were going to get service. And then they'd swivel over to another service to make sure that an order was captured. Uh, and so they'd have to rekey in all of these different uh, things. And so data integration is kind of where my specialty is, is bringing all this data underneath one place so that it can be accessed and people don't have to swivel chair. Uh, two things. And so now we still have these problems, right? All of our data is not perfectly integrated. Uh, if you like using Yelp to find a review for a restaurant, you then have to like close that app and open another app, open table to like make a reservation, right? Those aren't like perfectly integrated systems. Um, but so what we did at OFA and what our goal of Narwhal, what I was originally hired on the campaign to do was say, okay, there's a person, right? But we all wear many different hats. So I have my voter hat from the voter file, what information can we take when, from people when they're wearing the voter hats? Okay, we have some volunteer hats, right? People are doing that. Let's take all of that information and combine that into the same place. We've got donation data, right? That's living somewhere else. Let's pull that all into the same place. Uh, we've got now social media data. What do people like? Uh, what, are, what are they into? What are they signaling? Uh, we've got all of their friends. Who do they know? Let's match that back to this information. Uh, and then we've got all of this survey data. Right? So bringing this all together behind one common place uh, was essentially what Narwhal was. And so this was actually super confusing on the campaign because Narwhal was really just a philosophy of accessing data through an API uh, instead of directly going into the database and accessing it. A lot of people thought it was a thing, right? Like when is Narwhal going live? And you're like, no, it's not a thing. It's a philosophy of accessing data. So like. Every, everything's using Narwhal because everything, the only way we allowed people to access data was through an API. But it wasn't a product itself, like call tool or the optimizer. Uh, it was just a philosophy, uh, which even in, inside the campaign, everyone did not get. Uh, so we always made a joke, like, we're going to launch it like next week. Like, there's nothing, nothing to launch, right? Um, and so then when, once we had all of this data living in one place, the analytics team in the cave were then able to basically the four most kind of popular groups, and of course there's more nuanced ones, were cutting persuasion models, 
turnout models, support models, and contact contactability models, right? Uh, from all the different data that we have, from all of those different sources, uh, putting people into groups and scoring them uh, based on those groups, right? And so this is individual level data that's coming in every single day. Modeling and rescoring is happening every single day and shooting out and then feeding back it out through the API to all the various different systems that need it. Uh, and so what I, when I try to talk about what a campaign is to other people, I say it's a list organization. You're doing something with lists is essentially what you're doing. You're either building your list, getting people to sign up, give you their email, give you any personal identifiable information you have. You're matching that list to try to match it back to the original source data. So as soon as you get an email and a birth date and a name, you probably start to have enough information to be like, okay, this is them on the voter file and this is their donation files, right? They're cutting lists, sending it to other people, sharing them, ingesting them, updating and predict them. Just a never ending cycle of looking at these lists. Uh, and so then what we also did in 2012, which was very different, is now take this data and match it to TV viewership data. TV viewership is the biggest budget line item buying campaign ads as the biggest item on the campaign. Uh, and before the 2012 election, People would do all of this work to cut their list for emails in 28 to like figure out whose door to knock on, to figure out whose phone to who to call, uh, to figure out where to send people to mail. And then they would go to TV and buy, you know, men, women, 18 to 34. Uh, and so we know in this campaign, like all the targeting is far more nuanced than that. So all women, I wish, were going to vote for Hillary Clinton, but they're not, as Susan Sarandon let us know this week. Uh, so it's far more complicated than just are you a woman and how old are you that helps determine whether or not a campaign should be reaching you, right? So TV specifically, um, these probably need to be updated a little bit. The numbers are a little bit off because I don't have the 2016 election here. Um, but only, these are the only elections since Bill Clinton that people had more than 20 channels available to them, right? So now there's like over 100 <laughs> channels available to most people in their house, plus all the digital content that's out there. Right? So there's just a massive amount of, of things that can be looked at. Set top box data, the company that I worked for, was the first people to patent getting that data off the box. And that only happened in like 2004-ish, 2005 ish time frame. So Barack Obama was really the only president that could have first taken advantage of this technology. Um, and then, yeah, so very, very new uh, data availability sets. Uh, and so what, what I described that was going on in media buying before this is cocktail napkin math. So if you're just a person who creates a commercial that does the creative side of commercial, then that commercial has to be placed somewhere, right? When there's three channels, I don't know, I could figure it out, right? Without having any experience, it's not that hard to figure out where to buy the ads, right? As it gets more complicated and we're in the place now, I wouldn't say it exactly looks like this, but it's just not super simple math where you just kind of can can on your hands kind of figure out where to place the ads, right? So we built the optimizer uh, and ended up spending significantly less for our ads than Romney did. Um, we also were able to take this kind of concept of a persuadable voter, which was modeled by the analytics team based on all the data that we had, and break this into groups uh, that represented TV viewership patterns. So persuadable voters who watch the local news, which up until this point in time, all of the media buyers were spending all of their money buying the local news because that made sense, right? It's a political campaign. The people we're trying to reach must watch the news, right? That clearly makes sense. So we'll buy our ads during the news. They were program targeting, not audience targeting, right? Um, and what we found out when we actually looked at the data was that 40% of persuadable voters didn't watch the local news. So if we didn't figure out somewhere else to buy their buy content, we were not reaching them. What we also found out is people like to call those people low information voters. I don't watch the news, I'm not a low information voter, right? I like get my news in various different sources. But what we also found was strong correlation of people who had watched a lot of children's programming, they had young kids in the house, were not watching a lot of the news, right? So totally makes sense if you think about it. So we took all of this data, the, the audience size, the target audience size, the price, that inventory cost, and consistency of how frequently they were there. We put it through a sorting algorithm so that we could rank everything, not just the three channels and the local news. Uh, and then we put it through a selection algorithm and we generated a buy suggestion report. So again, there was still some level of swivel chairing because there was no way for us to just push these buys into all of the systems. We then had to have our buyers now take these reports and then manually execute uh, what it was that we were trying to achieve. We were, it's very hard to say was something effective or not. We won 
so we get to say that we were the most effective. Uh, but just if you're just looking at cost spending, and again, I say that if I had done the same thing for Romney, he still would have lost uh, because it's not just about the data and the analytics. It's about the messaging and the candidate. Uh, but we were $48 million more effective that we just were able to put back into the campaign. Uh, and part of how we did this was Romney bought 18 different channels uh, during the course of the campaign, and we bought 100 networks deep. And that's because we were audience targeting, not content targeting. So we, the goal was to stop judging your audience. If they're watching The Real Housewives, if they're watching The Honey Boo Boo, if they're watching whatever it is that they're watching, that's what they're watching. Don't judge them. The audience, the data is telling you that they're there by the ads. Uh, people were actually a little bit nervous about this in the beginning because, and I understand it from like a corporate brand perspective, a brand association, but political ads are almost 80% negative. So, I mean, why do you care if a <laughs> Romney is terrible ad is airing next to something that you think is like low quality viewing, right? <laughs> if your audience is really there. Uh, so, and then just various different things. Uh, and so, this is one of my favorite quotes from the campaign. It's from David Seamus, uh, who's our director of opinion research. Uh, and it, what we were able to do, uh, kind of just a thing that I say all the time, is technology uh, made us global, right? Planes, trains, automobiles, TVs. We now can kind of go all over the world, but data takes things back to a personal level uh, where you don't have to roll things up so much. You can do individual level targeting uh, again. So 2016, because of like Citizens United and kind of what's going on, the, the, just the TV spend alone in political in the cycle is expected to be $4 billion. Uh, and so this is what I think, you know, just in my nerdy world, is the sexiest thing going on. And we did this a little bit uh, in 2012 OFA. Uh, but what inventory costs uh, is you can't, so if I wanted to buy Microsoft stock today, I would go to Google, put it in, and I would find out how much Microsoft stock costs, right? If I wanted to buy uh, MTV in the this market, this TV market that you guys, I have to have like a lot of connections, know who people are in order to find out what it costs, and it doesn't cost the same amount for everyone. Uh, it's like they kind of look at you and they're like, eh, I think you can like pay this. And so there's vast ranges of what this inventory can be priced. Uh, this is a quote from like Chris, Chris Rock, but I think it totally captures uh, what's going on is no one knows what anything costs in the TV industry. So it used to be, and these prices are actually going down, but media buyers were getting 12% uh, prior to the 2012 election cycle, uh, just because they knew who to talk to and they knew when they were getting a taken advantage of. So the total media spends, 12% of it would just go into the buyer's pockets, right? Uh, and so this is a place where actually politics is affecting TV uh, in that the FCC, uh, now it's required that for political spending needs to be reported. And again, this is again, if government understood technology, they would also say, and here's the format, uh, that it needs to be reported in. Uh, a lot of these guys, because they think it's the most secret information in the world, like they'll po it has to be posted digitally, but they'll take a picture of an Excel sheet and like put it on the site. Uh, so the process of actually getting this data is super, super labor intensive uh, kind of nightmare. Uh, and so up until uh, just recently, it was just broadcast stations that had to report this data, but now all cable and radio. And so this actually, once you get this data and it becomes just like it was always possible to know what your neighbor paid for his house, but now you just have to type it into Zillow so everyone does it, right? So you have an idea of what's going on. Once this data gets cleaned and processed, and this is one of the projects I'm working on, and then if you match it back to something like audience behavior and audience measurement data, even if only 10% was ever bought of what was, could possibly be bought, you can actually model efficiently uh, what everything should cost and what all inventory sellers are doing. And so I like this picture. This is what I imagine all the inventory sellers are like. It's like when you have a kid and it's time to leave the party and they have this meltdown, this is happening, but he's still leaving, right? <laughs> it's like he can have this meltdown as much as he wants, but the party's still over, right? So the, all of the inventory sellers are going to drag their feet and make it as impossible uh, as they possibly can in order to get this data, but people are pulling the data and getting it, and we're modeling data. And finally is like in unique incremental reach and frequency distribution. So this was the data that we had available to us in 2012. So we'll kind of test all of your data science abilities, right? So from here, you can see, OK, if I bought an ad uh, in this first spot, I would get 30,000 persuadables. If I bought an ad in the second spot, I would get 10,000 persuadables. Now, really, from this data, how many persuadables did I get? 
I don't know if it's 40,000 people or some of those 30,000 people saw it twice. I have no idea. I'm blind to that information. You just do the de best you can with the data that you have available. We optimized for best cost there, CPM. What's the best deals we can get? But we just had to remain blind to this fact. Ohio is the only market where we had um, uh, granular enough data to answer this question. And what we were able to see was that 6% with our media buys, which were far more efficient than they'd ever been, 6% of the people that we were trying to reach were still seeing 60 OFA ads a week. Forget about all the other ads that they were seeing. They were seeing 60 OFA ads a week, and that wasn't our goal. Uh, and most households were only seeing one, two, or three times a week, right? So what can you do if you have access to the information to move some of those buys? They might be more expensive. They're not the best deal, but they're getting the frequency reach from distribution that you have. So this is the data that's available now, and that I'm working on making available to, to campaigns and what campaigns are now using. From this level of data, you can start seeing, OK, if I buy an ad here, this household's going to see it for the second time. This household's going to see it for the first time. So optimization is going beyond what's the best cost per 1,000 voters that I can get. Optimizations are going to how do I optimize my frequency goal of getting 8 to 16 impressions per week to a household. So that's it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So thank you all for having me and for being here. Um, so I'm excited to talk about all of the great things and awesome analytics work that they just talked about and say, well, what happens when this is not in the context of a presidential campaign? What happens when it's 2010 after 2008? What happens when it's 2014 after 2012? Right? So what do other campaigns that are not the Obama campaign, that are not even the presidential um, kind of level of the Republican side, um, what are they doing with all of this? And so how do um, down-ballot races work within a culture of analytics that might in fact become more of a cult of analytics that they ascribe to, but maybe don't do so well at actually executing? Um, and so the kind of big picture question that I'm interested in is not just what's going on in campaigns, but what does this mean for citizenship? How are campaigns asking us to be political animals? Um, and so kind of extrapolating these big picture ideas about digital democracy and kind of citizenship in a digital age too. Um, so the first question that I kind of am interested in is just this big one of what does it mean to act politically? Um, and then so for today, I'm going to talk about how do campaigns deal with this rise of data and analytics? And then how does it reflect on that kind of bigger picture question also? Um, and in fact, right, uh, as I kind of said, it is not going to be the most optimistic story and kind of not as uh, exciting as, as these guys showed. And so we can talk about kind of how these things meet in the middle also. Um, so just to give some background about what the type of stuff that I'm going to be talking about today, nobody else did this, so I'll breeze right through. Um, but it's a combination. Um, like Dan's work, it has been a long time uh, coming. I started ethnographic participant observation in 2010 of a federal level campaign. And so really this interest in, OK, what are campaigns doing when they really don't know what they're doing, right? Um, congressional, Senate level races, they don't always have um, the staff that know all of the kind of best tactics. Um, they're not at the top. They don't get all of the top level kind of uh, political consultants. And so kind of mirror, or supplemented that with in-depth interviews with campaign staffers, um, working with 49 consultants and staffers in uh, following the 2011 and into the 2012 cycle, um, and then supplementing that with 15 interviews from 2014 also to catch up with these people again and say, OK, what's going on here now? Um, or what has changed? What hasn't changed? Um, and then also talking about the actual text that campaign staffers are producing. So not only going into the nitty gritty of what they're doing, um, like we've heard, but also then looking at the stuff that they produce. And also, especially what I'm going to talk about today, is um, looking at some of the trainings that they produce in order to teach other staffers how to do this work also. Um, and kind of that infrastructure building that Dan was talking about in terms of, especially on the left, a lot of organizations saying, trying to teach other people in the field how to do this work better. Um, and so basically, um, if we start even from kind of the post-08 era, it was not only kind of this Facebook election as kind of it was extolled in, uh, in mostly kind of journalistic accounts of everything going on, but it was really about data too, obviously, as we have heard here. Um, but it was really this kind of analytics um, election. 
But at the state level race, especially in 2010, this was just not going to be the case. Um, and so what it really looked like there, and so, well actually, so the field teams had data, but the communication staffers were really faltering. So when Dan's uh, thing was up here with all of the amazing and different companies that were being produced and the different technologies and data and analytics work that was being done in all four fields, when you look down ballot, and unless it was one of the like, most competitive Senate races in the country, the top part, all those comms ones, were very, very empty. Um, and we, I'll talk to in specifics later, but they kind of, they had some of them available to them, but the use was not as uh, beautiful as you guys um, would show, or uh, kind of you guys did show. And so when it did come to the other realms, field and finance, they were using a ton of data to do exactly that work of finding out who to hit for all this stuff, be it TV or to ask for money. Um, but when they were talking about how do I get my message out on social media that it didn't look so analytics heavy um, or analytics heavy at all at the local level. And so from 2010 to 2014, really this move and kind of uh, the trajectory of campaigns here has occurred within what has kind of been known, on, especially on the left, um, within this call of a, a, for a culture of analytics or a culture of data. Um, and so this was a really particular term that was called, uh, kind of coined by the New Organizing Institute and in kind of its attempts to build this infrastructure out on the left. Um, and so what happened is that really the advocates for the, what was called the culture uh, of uh, analytics um, took off majorly after 2010 um, in a really big way. And so this happened in a lot of ways. Uh, the New Organizing Institute, which I mentioned, um, which is now uh, kind of in disarray, but it trained hundreds of people kind of in this culture of analytics. And what that meant was it trained them to um, do the work of experimentally testing email messages against each other, um, of doing a lot of testing of which image looks better here, which subject header. So all of the emails that you receive from a presidential campaign have been tested fi against 50 different versions of themselves, right? To see which one works better, to use that experimental, um, like very rigorously analyzed data to make future messages and to build or to create the best message for that specific time and to use that in the future. Um, and so this is what they tried to do and what they were training people to do. So also at consulting conferences, training panels increased threefold in just that period of time from 2010 to 2014. Um, and so it went from like uh, eight to, or it went from three to 12 actually, just the amount of panels and kind of teaching people how to do this work. Um, by 2014, the analytics-based panels made up 50% of all trainings. So anytime that people were in a room trying to teach you guys how to run a campaign, 50% of these were ending up being digital um, and analytics-based trainings. And so that's, that's a lot, right? So this is a major movement within especially the left um, and that, that had a lot of cachet that people were really buying into and that people were really dedicated and talking about in a real way. And so basically the consultants um, from both sides adopted this rhetoric also. So people were very into this and were talking about how important it was to their own campaigns and to kind of their movements as a whole. And so when we look at 2010, um, this question became, okay, well, what data matter? And so 2010, as I said, is going to be especially kind of um, regressive after we hear uh, what, what everybody was talking about earlier. Um, so in 2010, the question I, I was talking to campaigns and asking them was, okay, well, what do you look at then if you're interested in data? And so this first one was just superficial data. Um, my favorite was the, the campaigns that thought that more Facebook friends was, of course, the data marker that you wanted to hit more than anything else, which sounds a little bit silly to us maybe now. Um, but this culminated in one pretty major campaign, in fact, buying like 5,000 Facebook friends because they wanted to be shown to be in this race to have who had the most Facebook friends. And so that sounds like a kind of silly idea, of course. Um, but it was a really particularly bad idea because all, all of those Facebook friends who they bought, they not only weren't voters, right? They weren't the, the targeted TV ad buy. Um, but they also didn't even live in the country. <laughs> this is how uh, data click farms kind of get you to buy their stuff or provide the bodies, the clicks, to do to that they can sell. Um, so then for that particular campaign, not only did they not have any of this data um, that was meaningful, but they had to go in and manually delete all of their friends because they're actually messing up their other data also, right? So this move for superficial data caused them lots of lots of time and energy in the campaign. And so they, were, they, so they did a little bit more than that also. 
occasionally they did this thing called A-B testing. And so it looks like this. So this is obviously a 2012 example. Obama's hair is gray. Um, <laughs> right? Um, but so an A-B test is that I would give half of you um, this one and half of you this one. And you would click, and it would be for a limited time. And then based on that, whoever, whichever one garnered the most clicks, that would go out. Sometimes in more specific or in you know, more highly kind of um, analytic campaigns, they would know which ones to put to which people. But right, the basic is just which one uh, works the best, and you put that up there. And so occasionally, campaigns at the higher congressional or Senate level would do this work. Um, but really, what they would do is they uh, would do this a couple of times during the campaign, not for a ton of messages, not for everything. They would do it maybe once in the beginning to make their website. And uh, one of the campaigns that I was observing, um, they did it once in the last two months of the campaign for one splash page. Right? And so this was not the way that the kind of culture of analytics was actually supposed to work. You were supposed to constantly test every single message, right? Um, not just once in a blue moon. And in fact, this is a quote of a digital director who was very into the culture of testing, saying you can't just test one email and expect it to work, right? You can't do one A-B test and expect to have a culture of, of testing and analytics here going on. And so then when I returned to a lot of these uh, staffers in 2014, what I really found was that this became analytics in name only. And so I went to them, I asked them, what are you doing? Uh, like, and how, are you data-driven campaign? And then which ones are you doing? And they said, yes, yes, we are data-driven. We are super into it. It's so exciting. Um, and then from this polling, and then they told me that we're so into data that we're using polls. We've had polls since the 60s, right? We've had national polls since then. We're doing dial tests. Not very new to, to do a little dial test to see if you respond to a message on TV, right? But they were saying, oh, yeah, we're data-driven. We're using this really old data, though. Um, so really, it was just kind of this rhetorical tool for them. They were also, they had email systems at their disposal that would make targeting these CRM systems um, that we heard about, right? They would make this targeting really easy. Um, and they would use them to splice a list in the beginning, but they weren't returning to them to make a lot of changes, right? They weren't using the data that they could have had to make all of these changes down the road to either change what messages they were sending or that often to even retarget them, right? And so, and then when they did use them, they also often used not the best metrics or the kind of top line, did people open it, right? Did they look at it uh, in order to assess whether that was, uh, whether the message was successful or not. And so when I asked one of these, um, uh, one of the staffers, like, okay, are you using, you have like a, this CRM system going on, you have this data, so did it change the way you constructed your message? One of them said, no, we knew what our message should be from our polling, and we wanted to stay on message, right? So like, we had this data that was telling us that certain things worked and didn't work, but we had a message calendar, and we were going to stick to it. And that's the way the campaigning works, right, according to them. And so then there was this kind of second quote that I found really um, uh, important kind of explaining the other reason why campaigns did not do this rigorous testing of many, many messages. And that was that they just did not have the bandwidth, right? We didn't have the bandwidth or the time, really, to write a bunch of different emails. If you're going to test a dozen different emails and see which one works better, or even subject headlines and see which works better, you have to do that, right? Um, you have to have the bodies uh, in the staff to do that. And really, at the local level, they don't have that infrastructure. And so then I did find one kind of type of data that was, in fact, used. And that's this data that's baked into um, technologies, either the CRM systems, but especially social media data that is very clearly available on the back end to campaigns. And so of the 15 people that I talked to, all but two of them said they did use in-app analytics for things like social media, for Facebook, for Twitter. And that's because it makes it really, really clear like on the back end of those programs. And in fact, most of them thought I was really being stupid for asking them if they were using it at all. They were like, of course, what are you talking about? Um, and so even then, one of the staffers who said, no, I don't use it, when I uh, asked or when I pressed him a little bit more, he said, oh, well, I guess I looked at them, but I didn't use them. So even a person who was like, I'm not invested in this data, was like, oh, of course I looked at it, right? Like, I can't not look at this big chart that is available there. Um, so that was especially kind of funny to me. 
Um, but then, and also just to say that which social media tracker, so which extra third party analytics are you going to use, not even just saying that, that Facebook showing you on its own, um, which other third party um, app are you going to use is a constant topic of discussion. Hmm. And this is just another um, staffer saying, okay, those native analytics told us what worked, right? They told us what people um, wanted, right? So that, okay, we, we think that this thing actually does tell us some, uh, give us some indication of what messages people want. Um, and so that this, where this kind of lies in the problem um, where, well, okay, so if you think that this data is giving you the answer, what kind of, what good is the data or is the data actually good, right? Um, and so to just kind of analyze some of the, or to show some of the problems with that, uh, the top line of Facebook data that made, is made available here, basically they just show you the amount of people reached. They show you if you've gone up or down recently. They show you, um, oh, what is the other one? Oh, post engagement, right? They give you a vague term, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but they just give you some top line numbers of how many people you've reached. Even if you go into a little more, uh, the data more deeply, these are individual posts. You just see these big bars that are so visible um, and everything else are just the ones that worked better or that got more eyeballs on them, basically, right? Um, and eyeballs and likes, and then there's a separate column for shares, which kind of is how they construct this engagement metric, right? Um, so that these are basically just telling you things about popularity, not any of the great in-depth discussions or in data that we've actually heard about here. Um, and so uh, if this is just a, the Twitter version, looks remarkably similar, right? Are you going up or are you going down? How are your, these are your impressions per day. So this was a good day, this was a good post, this is a bad post, right? Um, but so basically it's a very similar, you get a popularity metric, you get popularity over time. You can drill down, uh, where is it here? So if you click on here, you can go into audiences, you can get some of that more targeted stuff. You can get geography, you can get in Twitter, you can get interests, right? You can get some of that in Facebook also. Um, but it's deeper, right? You have to do through that clicking. And that this was just not a thing that campaigns were spending time to click through and deeply analyze a lot of this stuff. So they're going to what it showed you immediately and what that really was, was popularity. Um, and so like I said here, something that worked means that it just has greater reach, right? Um, and it's important to note that visually, these native analytics really highlight kind of this baseline popularity metric, um, which is not uh, the kind of best, most, um, most productive or efficient way to do things either. Um, and so these complex engagement metrics that I talked about earlier are really not complex at all. They are actually just some combination of how many eyeballs saw your thing, how many eyeballs clicked on a part of your thing, right? Um, but this is kind of understood or, or positioned and displayed as actually being complicated and interesting and like you're really doing data-driven work. Um, audiences are available, like I said, but it's not the default. And so campaigns were really beholden um, to proud privately owned platforms really decided to display this stuff, right? So they didn't have control over the back end. They didn't have control over changing any of this stuff. Um, and it really was out of their hands. Um, and also it's important to note that the mystery around kind of how to use data really leads to this defaulting of easy, right? So despite the kind of culture of analytics and all of this infrastructure building, that a lot of the staffers of everyday campaigns really don't know what to look for in this stuff, right? They're good at reading on a printout when you are canvassing all of the data that you have there and knowing how to go from there. But really in the, in the back end of social platforms, they don't know what to look for. So they default to what's visually available. And so the implications of this, and kind of this is where I want to talk about citizenship a little bit, is that okay, campaigns are motivated to actually seek a particular version of what is a successful post, right? And that this is basically pr like um, privileging reach or popularity over really, really great politically productive things like mobilization, right, and getting people to participate more, um, and even talking about political persuasion as a more actively and participatory kind of measure. Um, and so here, the problem that I, as I see it, um, is that popularity really becomes a stand-in for deeper, more participatory politics. And I'm usually an optimist. I usually stand up here and say, oh, no, this is so good, right? We are not just people with hats on who don't have, who don't have faces to campaigns, right? 
But the data in this case are not tapped in a way that does see us as potential opinion leaders, as kind of potential new arbiters of this message. So that is not exactly an uplifting thing. The data are all, or, oh, the data are not used to identify individual people. It doesn't try to bring new people into the equation either. Right? It also has a very kind of limited managed view of citizenship. Usually this is where Dan comes in and says, no, this is too managed. This is just targeting the campaign more. And I say, no, it could be participatory. But here, it doesn't really look like that's the case. Um, and so as we kind of turn to data and analytics, um, I think it's really important that campaigns think about how to do this deeper, more participatory work too. So thanks. <laughs>
but normatively, um, Hirsch and, and myself sort of fall in that, in that um, data used in a service of, of increasing electoral participation might not necessarily be a bad thing. So I'll just say that. I would say I bought the New York City voter vial for $300. Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, and I've definitely used it in sometimes mildly creepy ways. Yeah. Uh, Nate? If, if we had really good digital strategies, one would think that'd be too much money to, to, to spend on TV. But yet, we don't, as far as I can tell, at least I'm a political scientist, no one, everyone still thinks that television is, is the coin of the realm. And so it's, a, it's like, yeah, most of the people that are super pushing in this cycle to get more money pushed to digital, or at least pulled out of TV, are making commissions off of the digital buy. So you have to take well, things. That's true with TV too, right? so yeah, it's actually it's 100% true. Right? Comscore does both, so so yeah. there's we have no real uh, care which one which one people do. For me, like yes, digital viewership is going up and digital activity is going up, but people are watching Netflix. You can't buy an ad on Netflix, right? It's not like it's going up in ways that you can buy ad content to do something with that. So a lot of the, the reason why the spike is going up so much is I kind of, this you know, TV won the internet, right? And so people are watching things where they're avoiding commercials completely uh, with watching HBO Now, watching watching Showtime, watching all of these things. There's no commercials in these, in these services. So yes, digital usage is going up huge, but if you actually measure the place of digital usage that can be ad supported uh, or can be even just like Twitter where I can put out my own content and maybe people will respond to it. That's going up, but not enough to compete with like TV in, in the 2016 cycle. Like overall, I think all TV will switch to being delivered digitally and then it's still TV that's just not coming through your Quaxel cable. It's coming through uh, through through why it's just it's just a different medium, but that's still TV as a concept, little kids don't think about TV uh, in the same way, same way that we do, right? So, so no, I don't. I think that the four billion. If I think it's all ridiculous how much money we spend on politics, but if we're spending this much, the ratio of four billion to one one billion uh, is about right, I think. Yes, sir. You, you focused on the effectiveness and efficiency of the marketing to the voters. How much of the information that you gather comes back to perhaps changing the product you're marketing and informing the, the policy discussions? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm definitely not an expert in that area. I'm definitely an expert in the uh, spending money, not so much in, in the in the messaging part. There's still like limited, so even in the TV stuff, because we don't match back to, we're not able to take the TV data and match it back to the voter file, so we're not able to say you are a low consumption TV household. Uh, and so then we have to like b do more digital or you're responding to this. Most of the message testing is still very, this knob <laughs> dialing thing, is it responding? There is one example that's different um, that Dish and Direct TV offer where you can actually do targeted TV buy. So if you and your neighbor live next door to each other, you actually could see different ads. Uh, and some of the most of, uh, interesting message testing I've seen is people will do that and do a survey beforehand make sure that they get exposed uh, and they can actually kind of count and make sure it's happening and then do a survey after the fact and see if there's been messages. And so that's at least more realistic than people going into a room, 12 people, and kind of getting their, their done. It's just in their native environments. Uh, but no, I think that's where there's uh, still a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of the optimizers right now are on spending, uh, and there's still a lot of room for improvement for adding more analytics to the messaging. Do either of you know if the dials have gotten more specific in how they are testing the dial test? Because as far as I know, it hasn't. I, I don't think yeah. it has, yeah. I mean, I think I take your broad question to sort of be, do we have better forms of representation on the basis of this sort of data, right? Or, or does what you're learning about voters ever get back to the policymakers? Right what those voters would really prefer to see. I mean, I think where there's also a problem here is that the messaging teams, even on the Democratic side, are all white men, 
right? So it's like even with this A-B testing of things that are happening, if you don't have a diverse group of people coming up with something, like something will always win in an A-B world. That doesn't mean that either of them are good, right? Or that are reaching the people uh, that you're trying to reach. So I mean, part of that is solving that problem on that side. Not It's not a technology or data problem. It's diversifying the original pool of possible messaging. And especially for the people making the TV ads, too. Like, so that's really siloed still. And they aren't influenced by these new thinkers that Dan's pointing to. Like, the TV people are the TV people. They might then use that uh, new data to put it to better households. But yeah, they're the same people. Uh, so how much of this analytics work is done in-house by the campaigns? And how much of it is contracted out to these private companies? And what is the level? I mean, are there? Is there high profitability for the companies that do it privately? Like, it sounds like there's a lot of money flowing through the pipeline. There's a lot of money flowing through the pipelines, but I would say a lot of outside companies that work on specifically presidential campaigns kind of don't make money considering how much work that they have to do into it. They're doing it for the PR and earned media that they themselves can then, if they win, sell and get more corporate work or other work down the line. Uh, so especially for technology and analytics providers, not media buyers. Um, that role, uh, a lot of them, like BSD definitely loses money on the Obama campaigns because overall uh, they make money, uh, kind of in the bigger picture. I've already lost context to the other part of his question. So they, yeah, sorry. Oh, and OFA was all done in-house okay. uh, in that situation. And that is very much a re-election okay. campaign reality that you can support and very hard to do when you're dealing with the primaries. Um, so the Republicans in general outsource most things. Um, but now in like Hillary's campaign, there's a lot of or like a lot of tech, there's company Groundworks so that is doing a lot of their uh, technology. Civis and Blue Labs are two analytics companies that are doing stuff. Uh, and it's also just like depending, it's also harder to hire, even though it's like Hillary Clinton. Uh, it's harder to hire for because you don't know when your job's going to end. Whereas at OFA, I knew I was committing to a year. Uh, and that year was definitely going to happen. There was not going to be like someone who committed to the Scott Walker campaign, and that like <laughs> blew up in their yeah. face in an unexpected way, and then all of a sudden they don't have a job. So this cycle, I think, a lot more is being even on both sides, even on the Democratic, is going out of campaign. Yeah, I would say. I mean, so as Carol mentioned, one of the the um, things that I found in my book is that there's a technical advantage of incumbency um, that didn't exist previously, which is to say that if you have a longer runway. You can staff up, you can build organizations, you can hire talented people like Carol to come work for you. Um, you can do the recruiting work, and plus, you know that you're going to be employed for a longer period of time, so it's easier to recruit and bring things in-house. Um, with in, in certain time-pressured instances, you are going to draw more on sort of what is your ecosystem of consultancies. Um, that said, we I did find, I mean, across campaigns that have similar resources and time, Democrats more generally seem to, at least given the FTC data, have more of a preference for bringing things in-house um, than Republicans, which, which go outside. The disadvantage to going outside is that you get less in the way of accountability. Um, oftentimes, you might spend more money um, in the long run over, over contracting with, with consultants. Campaign um, staffers don't okay. get paid that much yeah. in the exactly. grand scheme of things. That's right. Um, and uh, in any event, there's a, there's a number of differences. But it looks <laughs> like this is another one of those differences between campaigns and parties as well, in that there are certain preferences for how you want to staff up your organizations. But like the Democrats specifically, like Alon, the person who's the chief analytics officer on the Hillary campaign is a founder of Blue Labs. He took a leave from Blue Labs right. to go work yeah. for so the campaign. Question, I guess following up, and sorry for taking yep. up so much time, but uh, would be, so these companies, would you say, uh, have a lot of the times been started uh, from political campaigns, like someone works on a political campaign that does analytics and then start founds a company. So, but the revenue for these companies is now primarily coming from political campaigns. Otherwise, they couldn't stay open. So, where is the revenue coming? Commercial firms. Commercial firms who get, because I would say that, ad, especially in the ad buying world, I always say it's like the presidential campaign is like the Super Bowl of ad buying. Uh, and so, there's so much press and, and, and media uh, writes about it so much. So, if I was doing an ad campaign for Tide, no one's really that interested in the New York Times writing about it, right? Uh, but if I do for President Obama, someone from the New York Times wants to write about it when it's all said and done. Uh, and so it, uh, all of the corporate customers are then like, oh, we want to do what we just read about in the paper and make sure that we can do it. So, so there's an advantage to being in politics where they, they find other clients. There's a, you get the same way that like earned media is always more valuable than paid media. If you can 
be successful uh, on one of these campaigns, you get a lot of earned media from it, and then you can spin that into other things. So the last question is going to go to a student. Is there a student with a question? Andreas. Um, so at OFA, we matched two various different things like that, and we found it like use, use, useless, right? Like finding out that someone subscribed to cat magazines didn't help us determine uh, if they were persuadable or not. Uh, frequently, that kind of data just gets used as some metric in some marketing slide. Like we're matched to 30,000 different data points. And you're like, OK, yeah, but only like you know, 100 of them are probably useful uh, in this model, right? So. Uh, so I don't I don't find that a lot of that that data matching is 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 useful. But do you want to give your manager? So uh, no, I mean, so I mean, I would say that I mean, Carol's exactly right. Like most of the um, mo most of the models that are useful um, tend to come from public data. Um, tend to come from data like um, you know party registration, party ID. Um, so I don't think that it's changed all that much, although the modeling has gotten more sophisticated um, and it's gotten more powerful. And at the end of the day, it gets yoked into how do we make m as many voter contacts as we possibly can efficiently and try to figure out you know, what is going to mobilize people to either turn out to vote on election day or um, to help um, persuade people who might be open to persuasion. Um, I think the big, broad, normative story that we've seen over the last 20 years is a move from air wars, air campaigns, where you just slap up in, in a very untargeted way a couple of advertisements in a very unsophisticated way and, and hopefully reach voters of interest to much more of a reinvestment in personal contact, whether that's at the doors of voters through things like canvassing, um, whether it's um, uh, mediated through social media and social networks, or whether it's targeted um, you know, in a much more personalized fashion. The way that I tend to see it is precisely the story that, that Carol tells. It's a world of much more fragmented media, many more challenges. It's a lot harder to break through. Most people are not political junkies. Most people don't care a lick about politics, right? They're, they're not folks who are showing up at forums like this to think about politics. So how do you reach them? How do you make politics meaningful? How do you connect with people in a way that helps them translate their political interests into a vote on election day? Um, I think that's really this, this sort of big story and how all of this is, is sort of yoked to electoral politics. And, so, and to just kind of continue this normative question of citizenship, because I think it's so important, is to say that I actually think this is like the most pessimistic bummer part of like where I don't see kind of the light at the end of the tunnel as much. Because even as kind of Dan said, that's really important and that can increase turnout and participation and that sounds good. Right, but and fundamentally, and, and I know that you agree with me on that too, but is that it, um, it's a version of citizenship that is, I want to manage you and I want to make sure you see the right message so that you vote for me and so that you do my bidding, essentially, right? Um, I think there's a way to make those messages not have that as the end goal. I think that there are these opportunities and kind of uh, points of bubbling up of potentially using that to create new opinion leaders, right? And so, and it's not that campaigns and staffers don't want to do this, right? They have very uh, salient democratic norms of, of these kind of big picture uh, goals if you talk about them after the fact. Um, but that, that right now, because it's a zero sum game, because you need to get out the vote in that day, right? Um, that that's how it ends up looking. And I think there are, that especially the more advanced uses of data are doing this. They find new opinion leaders online and they literally, the Obama campaign sends them an email and maybe they ask them to work for them or maybe they just ask them to tweet for them as they did in 2012. Um, and so that's doing this more participatory work, less kind of just depressing managerial 
get you to see the message that works for my individual self and then will get me to vote that day. So we've talked about networking, mobilization, and personal contact. Our version of that is a reception. So you are all welcome to go to the third floor. And uh, we have a reception starting right now. All the panelists will be there. Please join me in thanking them.